focus on finding a GM. And tonight we're going to be talking about maybe reuniting with some old flames or some old former employees, maybe bringing them back as a GM, maybe some, uh, some new names, not some, not some new names. And the GM search is getting a little bit wider, but is it really? We'll talk about that. And also, there's only one Hall of uh, Fame inductee, one well, in addition to Fred McGriff. We'll talk about that. And also, Billy Wagner, he did not make it this time around, but most likely he'll be a Hall of Famer next year. We'll discuss this and more on this edition of the Locked on Astros podcast. Not working. <laughs> All right. Well, the intro's not working. That's okay. We'll throw it in audio. So, Eric, <laughs> hey, I'm H. John Wellhouse. Welcome to Locked on Astros. We are your team every day. Just know that this episode is we are your first listen every single day. And this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel is the number one sports book, the official sports book of Locked on. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. So I'm H. Wheelhouse. You can find me at H. Wheelhouse on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find me at Strohs411 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Always positive, always Strohs. Eric, where can they find you and where can they find the show? You can find me at Eric Talk Strohs. You can find the show at Locked on Astros, and you can find us safe uh, despite all the tornadoes that hit the Houston area. So hopefully you uh, this episode finds you safe. And I know that a tornado actually hit like just a couple blocks down from my school. We had to shelter in place um, at the end of the day. And I know it hit many different locations. It was what's, what's called a tornado emergency where it would come down, then go back up, come back down. And this is something that Houston has not seen in a long time. So hopefully this episode finds you safe and your house safe. And But there's a lot of people out there that was not as lucky. And so if you know somebody that needs a helping hand, go and give them a help. And uh, yeah, so that's what the Astros have been doing a really good job at is just um, with the Astros Foundation, just um, helping out the community. I know Mattress Mac has also done a great job. Uh, unfortunately, he lost some money with the Dallas uh, Cowboy game, $2 million. But uh, I guess that happens sometimes. But we're going to focus a little bit about uh, what's going on with the Astros GM search. I know that we, in the past episode, we talked mostly about Dana Brown. Dana Brown still makes the most sense. And if you listen to Jose de Jesus Ortiz, he says that based on the people he talks to and he trusts these people, uh, it's between Dana Brown and Brad Osmus. Wait, wait, what did I just say? Brad Osmus? Where the heck did Brad Osmus's name come from? He's he's uh, he. Yes, he was a hot topic nine years ago. But I'm sure there's some styles of clothes that we don't even wear from nine years ago. Well, we probably do, Brett. But um, no, uh, people that have drip don't. <laughs> I'm not that bad. I don't. I don't stay that far behind the fashion trends. But I'm definitely not up with the latest. Um, I can. I can throw on a little drip here and there. But look, here's the deal. If I'm being really honest, this Brad Osmus thing has got to be lip service, Eric. This has got to be, he's a buddy of Jeff Bagwell. There's there's no way that you have Dana Brown as a prospective GM or even we'll talk later about David Stearns and even some of the other names that are out there. Brad Osmus doesn't make sense. Number one, do I have to hearken back to his days as a manager with the Angels and the things he said about the organization? And just where it just didn't seem like he was really in cahoots or really nice with the club. He didn't play nice with us. And what does he have analytically, player development wise, that we are missing? Because the Astros have gotten player development right. We don't have a first or second rounder. That's also the question with 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 um, with Dana Brown as well is. How are they going to develop guys that aren't first and second round picks? Because we don't have a ton of those. We have a few of them recently. Um, the Brad Osmus talk just doesn't excite me. I know he may be a name bantered around, but sometimes 
you talk about people because you have a friend who's helping out, who's been kind of the mouthpiece of the organization so far in Jeff Bagwell, and I trust and respect Jeff Bagwell just with the utmost respect. I, I just don't see how Jim Crane can be serious or this can be serious about Brad Ausmus. And how much of this stuff is more speculative, you know, than actual serious talk? That's my question. Well, I think that it's this time of the off season, getting really close to spring training starting. I know all the business is done, but it's just kind of like looking at a deck of cards and you have to pick one. And at this point, you don't want to pick a joker. You got to pick the right one. And um, I know that Brad Ausmus is a smart guy. He may not have the best success as a um, as a manager, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have the wherewithal to um, to be a GM. I, I know he was highly sought after as a GM nine years ago, and a lot of people thought that he would be good. And even as a player, people thought that he would he has the the wisdom to kind of make that that leap. And if you're talking about David Stearns possibly being an option, we'll kind of talk about more about that in a second. But if you're going to wait one year, then maybe just bring in Brad Ausmus as a placeholder and just give him that year experience. Because if you bring in somebody like Dana Brown or some of these other guys we're going to talk about, you're going to have to give them a three-year commitment. But Maybe if um, Brad Ausmus just wants to just get a internship, so to speak, with the Houston Astros as a GM, uh, I mean, I, I just I see them. I could see why they want to bring him in, former player with the Astros, and he is a smart guy. But he and he will have the three headed beast still working with him. And from what I understand, these guys do know what they're doing, but they need a figurehead. And that's what Jeff Bagel is kind of being the spokesperson for right now, but they need somebody else to be that. And Brad Osmus could be that good figurehead, but I think they need somebody with a little bit more front office experience and we'll see what happens. Yeah. I, I you know, like I said, there's just not a single thing in Brad Osmus resume that excites me about him being the GM. You, right, I know. To me, you just got rid of a GM after a, after like a very short time. You offered him a one year contract because you knew David Stearns was the guy you were looking at. Um, this GM role, I think, is fine with these three at the helm and Jeff Bagwell being the spokesperson. I don't have a problem with that at all. Because, Eric, what are they going to do between now and then? Now, you're going to have them in charge of the next draft, right? You're not right. going to have – you're not going to you, – because it's going to be lottery. So we're not going to have one of those top picks anymore. And, I mean, even because of the place that we're going to hold and hopefully the run and the back-to-back -back thing that the Astros are trying to do, they're not going to be in that kind of position. So, to me, if it's just a placeholder, then just stand pat with the guys you have. Why bring in someone extra – to just let him go down the road. Yeah. That to me makes no sense. But Eric, what is it going to take though for the Astros to talk to David Stearns? Because they can't just go get him. What do they have to do? Because I don't know if everybody knows the situation in Milwaukee because Stearns is an advisor, but Astros still have to do something before they can even speak to him, right? Well, they have to get permission from the Brewers and because uh, he's under contract for one more year and the Brewers have already denied certain teams permission to interview with him. And yeah. so without that permission, you can't even talk to him. And Stearns has said the right things. He said, yeah, I'm not interested. But according to, I think it was Ken Rosenthal, uh, Jim Crane is very intrigued in bringing in David Stearns. And uh, even if you don't get him as GM, Next year, could he be president of baseball operations, something like that, bring him in as some type of role. But um, yeah, I don't really get the Brad Ausmus, and I don't know if I would bet on that. And I don't know if there's odds at FanDuel about that at all, but it's just something that I don't get. It's a name that just kind of got thrown out there, but Dana Brown is somebody that I would put some money on if I... Uh, was a uh, hat's money to put on. So let's talk a little bit about FanDuel because this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. That's right. The NFL playoffs are here. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner here at Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America, FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many 
great features to make betting on sports fun and easy. New customers join today to get started with $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's right, $5 for $150, not a bad deal. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash locked on. If you look there, the odds for the Astros, they are plus 600. They're the favorites to go back to the World Series and take it all again. FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to point spreads to player props. Go see if they think that Cool Joe from Cincinnati is going to go up against Jalen Hurts, the Channel View kid. Plus, you can even combine your bets for a chance to win a bigger payout, the same game parlay. All on the app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So football fans, don't miss out. Place your first $5 bet and get $150 in free bets, win or lose, at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Now, Eric, in this second segment, we, you know, the whole GM thing, we're just really not going to know until we see something happen. Well, there's some more names. We haven't talked about all the names yet. There's actually a new name that James Harris, uh, the Guardians assistant general manager, his name uh, has come up and they have spoken to him about the GM job. And so he's one. And so that's another addition. So uh, Bobby Evans, uh, his name has also come up. We also since uh, I don't think we've discussed this. Michael Hill, he has decided that he likes his cush job in the MLB <laughs> yeah. front office. And he's like. Oh, uh, I, I like making this money in the front in the front office. I don't want to have to actually come and work. That's a little bit too. I, I, that's probably not what he said, but he's comfortable working where he is. And uh, being a GM is hard. And that's why I don't get the whole Brad Ausmus thing. If he's been in the front office, then I would get it. Like if he was assistant GM or something like that, I would get it. But like making a leap from manager or bench coach to GM, that's a little bit of a big leap of faith there. And I just don't see it unless it's just a temporary thing. And that's what I was trying to say. Um, it, it, what I was trying to say earlier. No. Yeah. And I, and, and I, and I got that perfectly. I, I think that you, that you did a great job communicating that because I think that's where a lot of people are. And I think a lot of people who follow the Astros, I mean, you're right in the middle, Eric, of this golden era, you're six straight ALCS, your four world series, two of them you've won. And, you're not going to bring in someone who is, let's just face it, is at an amateur level when it comes to something like that. Again, sometimes names get mentioned and people get a look because they know somebody, and that may be what's going on here. I'm not, I, I don't know that for 100, percent but that's just my uh, my hunch there. Now, with the Hall of Fame talk, Eric, right. we had the Hall of Fame vote, and it was it was interesting because I was watching the MLB Network, and they were like, we may not have a name announced. And that's the exciting thing about the Hall of Fame. And that's what makes the Hall no, of Fame <laughs> the best Hall of Fame is because it's so hard to get in. And it's a, and it's basically the top one or two percent. And they're just bragging about all this top one or two percent. And I get it. I, I do honestly feel like the NFL and NBA at times is a little easy on the guys getting in. But I think there's a lot of different criteria as well. But when you look at the vote today, if you would have told me that Scott Rowland was going to be the only one to get the 75% threshold to make it in, I would have said there's no way. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that Scott Rowland's eight, eight gold gloves don't mean anything. That is top 20 ranking and certain defensive metrics as a third baseman all time isn't anything to worry about. But And I don't know if it was Holden from Locked on Rockies or if it was one of the Locked on hosts said today, he he belongs in the Hall of Very Good, not the Hall of Fame. Like, he was a good player. And there's nothing to be taken away from his defense and his offense. He was right. he was very good for what he did. And Billy Wagner, you know, he made a jump, Eric. He made a jump literally from like a 17.2% jump. Right. He He started out in 2016 all the way at 10%. Now he's all the way up to 68.1%. And Wagner said this to Berman, because Berman interviewed him today. Berman interviews everybody. Like, how does Mark Berman do it? He, he has all the cell phone numbers. He's been well, in the business long enough. He's got all of them. Sometimes I think he teleports because I'm like, wait, how is he at this at this football game? But now he's at this basketball game. The dude is everywhere. So this is what Billy Wagner said about his latest jump 
in voting. He said, I'm happy that I got this far and blessed. I have no complaints. Of course, I would love to get in. It's the pinnacle of any professional's career, but nothing's been easy this far. So why should it? And you know what? He respects the process. As Astros fans were upset, Billy Wagner isn't getting the respect he deserves. But he was third today. Right. You know, Todd Helton's not getting any respect either. And Colorado is 72.1%. So my question to you, Eric, do you think this is the final ballot that he just misses where you think the next time he's up, you think he makes that jump to 75%? Uh, yeah, I, I would actually uh, it, like if I was a betting person, I would put money on the fact that he's going to get in next year. I mean, the numbers just like he went from 31.7 to 46.4, 51.0 to 68.1 percent this year. And I, I think that he's going to make the jump this year. Enough people have seen that. OK, he's on the the um, the the. Cr- the uh, cusp of um, like just getting there and they're going to vote for him. And so I think it's the fact that he's a closer. He played for the Astros. He played for the Phillies. He played for the Mets for a little bit and for, but he's mostly known for the Houston Astros. And so I think that um, I actually have that list. Jay, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but um, so just looking at, is he going to make it next year? I would say yes. Now, going back to your Scott Rowan comment, um, there's a reason why he finished at 76.3%, just above the 75% needed. Enough people thought he was good enough, but not enough people thought he was great enough. And that's why that's that's perfect. Um, whoever said that comment about he's the hall of, hall of good or something. So the hall of very good, not the hall yeah, of fame. Right. Right. And so, yes. So you look at maybe somebody like Lance Berkman, I saw somebody in a comment say, well, with Roland getting in makes you think that maybe somebody like Berkman got robbed or Jeff Kent, this was his final uh, chance at it. And he's, uh, he fell short. He only got what 50, where is it? Um, 40 something percent. And so, uh, 46.5%, 181 people voted for Jeff Kent in his final thing, knowing that if they didn't vote for him, he was done. Yes. He could get voted in by the veterans committee and he probably will. But at the same time we have people. Yeah. It just, it's just weird. It's just, I know that Jose de Jesus Ortiz has, and a lot of people in the committee has pushed baseball to get more than 10 votes and, and make it more like a 10, a 12 person ballot or something like that, just so you can have more people to vote for. But at the same time, that would water down the, uh, I guess the pool and put more people in that maybe didn't deserve to be in there. So I, I think that Billy Wagner to answer your question is going to be in the hall of fame next year. Scott Rowland got in there by the hair of his chinny chin chin. Well, here's the thing with this whole Hall of Fame voting, um, since we're on the topic, the writers, now, it's their right to vote. Look, you know, when you talk about voting period, if you have the right to vote and you choose not to, that's your right. But to me, it's a waste. To me, it's a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't even vote for at least one. Like, you got to turn in a blank ballot. Like, I really want to question these guys. Like, how much baseball did you actually play? Like, you know, you may know the game, you may write about the game, and you you may be a, even a baseball savant. But at the same time, what are you doing not voting for anybody, not a single person? And I think that's the biggest tragedy. And I know I'm not alone in that because you you ask baseball people, you look through social media, and I'm not asking writers to just vote for somebody just because. But you can't tell me that a list of 12 people, you can't find one person to vote for you're that stuck up on the Hall of Fame that you can't find one guy to vote for. Right. It just makes no sense. And h- how does Billy Wagner not have 75% or more already? He's how does someone like Todd Halton stay out of it? It just is not me, Mariano Rivera. He's not Trevor Hoffman. He's not one of those big time names. Well, I, I know that, but but he he has a career that more people than not across baseball have him on there. It's a and popularity like, thing. You, yeah, well, you know, and look, here's the deal. You put this up here, and before we move on to this, 
if Barry Bonds isn't going to be in the Hall of Fame or Pete Rose isn't going to be in the Hall of Fame, then what are we doing? I mean, these are some of the most talented hitters ever. And I understand the controversy and I understand Pete Rose, you know, did his thing and did the betting on baseball. And I understand that. But Barry Bonds didn't take a single steroid until late in his career. And he was a multi MVP before any of that stuff happened. And if we're not going to let the best baseball players in, but we're and we're and then we're not voting for guys that weren't even tied to any controversy. Like I get it if you withhold votes from someone like a Bonds, from from someone who has something tied to them. But Billy right. Wagner, what does he have tied to him? He doesn't have anything tied to him. I think the thing holding him back is his postseason record. But is this a postseason award? And if it is, then you know what? Every Astro that goes on a Hall of Fame ballot should be in the Hall of Fame because they have more postseason games and wins than anybody in their generation, period, end of story. So let's not try to mix apples and let, let's not try to get things mixed up and blame Billy Wagner's playoff run or lack of, because if that's the case, then Jose Altuve, if he comes up, Bregman, if he comes up, all these guys are going to deserve it simply because of their playoff prowess. Yeah. So before we move on to the uh, 2024 ballot, I do want to mention that Carlos Beltran received 181 votes, 46.5%. This is his first year. That's um, almost um, the same amount that that uh, Jeff Kent got. So people were still voting for Carlos Beltran, despite being the first member of the Astros who was part of the 2017 team. So that it means that they're not going to vote for Astro in the to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, probably not even Jose Altuve, as good as his career could possibly be. They're not going to vote him in because Carlos Beltran, if it wasn't for that, he would probably, I don't know about first ballot, but um, he had a great career. He had a great postseason history and all that type stuff. So um, I think that the fact that he got almost to 50% in his first year, uh, this is a good test to see how baseball is gauging what happened in 2017 and looking to the future uh, for Jose Altuve and Alex Bregman and some of these other people uh, in their, their Astros yeah. career. And even well, to a certain extent, Justin Verlander, even though he didn't have any part of that, but he was still a member of that team. Well, honestly, I think out of all the names that we that we attached to 2017, I think the only one that's going to be truly, truly worthy of a Hall of Fame vote and, and a shoe in is Jose Altuve. And um, I, I heard some guys comparing Altuve to Mattingly. Mattingly, um, you really? know, well, but what I'm saying is, 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 is Don Mattingly in the Hall of Fame? He's I don't not, know off the top of my head. Yeah. He's not a Hall of Famer. Okay. Don Don Mattingly, um, he and Jose Altuve are almost identical. And basically, Don Mattingly, I mean, Jose Altuve will just have to keep doing what he's doing, and I think he'll surpass it, and I think he'll make it. Um, Don Mattingly is definitely one of the better, one of the better second basemen that that has has ever played. Right. Um, he is not there yet, but Altuve can surpass a Don Mattingly type of, of, you know, prowess. But look at this list that you put together here. These are the guys coming in next year, Eric. Jose Bautista, he's not making it. Um, <laughs> I can just tell you all these guys. Unless the door is uh, punching him, he's going to make it in. For <laughs> yeah, and maybe, maybe if this is Boxing Hall of Fame, you definitely put him in there. But Bartolo Colon, no thank you. Adrian Beltre. I think I, Adrian Beltre makes it. I think him. I think. Adrian I don't know Beltre. if he's a first ballot. He may be because he no. He was he was very much liked across baseball. I, I don't know about first ballot, but he's going to make it. Um, the only Adrian two Gonzalez, I see, yeah, yeah, the only two I see are him and Chase Utley, off like just 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 going off of name and just yeah. going off of not diving into all their stats. But I don't see any of these others. Victor Joe Mauer has had a pretty good career. I don't know if he's a Hall of Famer, but he had yeah. a pretty good career. Uh, Joe Ma Maurer had a great start to his career, but injuries kind of limited him. Jose Reyes had a good career, but uh, controversy kind of hit him hard. James Shields, whatever. David Wright may get some love just because he played for the Mets. Um, but yeah, this is not a very impressive list, so to speak. I think Adrian Beltre is the most likely 
of this list. I think Ch oh, yeah. Chase Utley for what he did as a second baseman. Uh, he kind of uh, brought back memories of uh, Jeff Kent and uh, Craig Biggio at second base, bringing back the, the offense. I guess there's a lot of good offensive second baseman now. So, Yeah, look, the bottom line is obviously this is a 1% vote, and I don't think anybody here puts any – um, any danger to Billy Wagner's, you know, taking votes from Wagner. Right. But the bottom line is this, Carlos Beltran, I think, has even more controversy tied to him because of not only his connection with the Astros, but also before that with all the talk with him with the Yankees. And I don't know, like Carlos Beltran, dude, when he first came up, when he came to the Astros, dude, he was this five-tool wonder. He hit the playoffs. He got, you know, he... He hit what was like nine home runs in the postseason. He was a rookie. I mean, not a rookie, but he was he was a really, really young player. And a lot of people in Houston hoped that he stayed. And obviously he went to New York. Um, we understand and we respect the Hall of Fame and we understand it as something for the elite. That's why we are just like, look, we're not saying Scott Rowland's a bad player. Eight gold gloves, that's nothing to bat an eye at. But when guys like Billy Wagner aren't getting in, when when other guys are out there, aren't getting in. And yes, Mattingly's career was cut short because of an injury, but he had a 307 lifetime average. Um, okay. Had he played longer and not gotten injured, there's no telling what he could have done. And he's right there with Altuve. Their OPS is almost exactly the same. I think Altuve has more home runs than Mattingly, but their 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 comparative stats are amazing. All Altuve has to do is play till he's 40, and I think he's I think he's in. Um, I would say Astros, but I'm not sure. Um, I would Jay think asked, the Astros. Yeah, Jay asked which cap that would Billy Wagner wear. I would say with the Astros. He had his um, most success with the Astros, but who knows? Um, but I want to kind of uh, close the show. We still got about, what, three minutes left on it's the lefty still on the market. You have Zach Britton, Andrew Chafin, and Matt Moore. Um, so these, uh, the kind of the demands and the price tag for has kind of decreased for these guys. And uh, Ken Rosenthal has mentioned that the Astros are one of the teams that do have the need and the flexibility to add one of these guys. Um, so I, and so this is definitely some, somebody that the one of these three guys is somebody the Astros can go after. I know Matt Moore was somebody the Astros always kind of wanted. Andrew Chafin is kind of a name that, seems always be on Astros radar and even Zach Britton was somebody. So uh, that's some, if you want a left-handed reliever, Dusty Baker, there's three yeah, of them and out there. We're right. And he also said that when the Phillies gave Matt Stram the two year, $15 million deal, that is what changed the expectations for these pitchers of what they would get paid. Um, you know, Stram, you know, his credit, he was, he is he is thirty one. He only threw forty four and two thirds innings last season, but he held up he held opponents to a six sixty four OPS. Where Chafin thirty two pitched fifty seven and one thirds innings, held opponents to a six nineteen OPS. More held them to a five sixty four OPS. So, but him getting that money is he's still close in that range. It seems like the Astros are still in on some of these lefties and the market for Yuli has become a race between possibly the Twins and the Astros. Seems like the only two clubs that realistically are willing to throw something at Yuli. Now, I haven't heard anything hard numbers or definitive about the Astros, but wouldn't it be interesting to see him in Minnesota with former Astro, as we jokingly talked about, Christian Vasquez, and former Astro C4. Carlos Correa. No, no, no. Former Astro, former Giant, former Met. Oh, Carlos my Correa. bad. You're right. Okay, I'm sorry. I forgot all the teams. Which which hat will he wear in the Hall of Fame? He'll be a Met. <laughs> He's going to be a Met. <laughs> He's going to be a sure. Met. He's going to be a Met. Uh, Carlos Correa goes in as a Met. In the, my, my career. Anyways, golly. Yeah, um, so look. Yuli is somebody that I think that makes a lot of sense if you can get him on a certain deal. I think the Astros want David Hensley, but um, as somebody, Jonathan Rogers, asked what happened to the Marlins. Yeah. I think after that trade, they don't really need him. They have Garrett Cooper, they have somebody else playing first base. And they have somebody at third base. You you don't really want to take playing time away from those young guys. And 
So yeah, you could go out and sell him, um, sign him, but Yuli's looking for a multi-year deal and nobody's biting. They want to give him one year deal and for him to be a reserve player. That's all he's going to get. So if he's going to have to be a reserve player, why not be a reserve player on a team that's going to likely go to the World Series? And so I think I'd rather see the the playing time go David Hensley. And I think even if Yuli signs, the, most of the utility of bats will go to Hensley. And, uh, but I think that if you're going to have Yiner Diaz or Yuli Gurriel, I think if you want that impact hitter off the bench, Gurriel could be that guy. So I just this, don't think he, I just don't think he's the impact bat anymore. He's not that guy. He, we, I mean, okay. Hey, um, uh, according to Chandler Rome, uh, despite Jeff Bagwell's optimism, they're not quite sure that Michael Brantley's going to be ready by opening day. Oh, really? Interesting. Did yeah. that just come out as we're talking? Uh, it came out, um, I want to say Monday or oh. yeah, so. <laughs> Monday. Wait, it's two. wait, it's Tuesday night. <laughs> How did we miss that? We didn't do okay, a show. It must have, it's all good. Look, here's the deal. We won't know until we see him out on the field. The bottom line is Michael Brantley's back. I'm not a big fan of bring, of bringing Yuli back. So I think he takes a roster spot. Um, I think he ends up somewhere like Minnesota. Someone said, what happened to the Marlins? You know, well, look, we're just going with what we're just trying to read the tea leaves. We're just going with what's out there. We're not, we're not breaking any news. We're not, we're not sources here. But we're trying to read all the tea leaves that are out there. So I think that wraps up the show tonight. Billy Wagner got stiffed again, but he'll get there next year, Eric. What? Uh, okay, in five seconds, tell me who your next GM is. One, two, three, four, five. Dana Brown. Oh, was I? Oh, you said in five seconds. Yeah, tell me. I thought I had five seconds from the time you counted. No, well, I was counting down oh. in five. <laughs> You're supposed to go five. <laughs> that's a countdown you went five four three two. whatever my my gm for the houston astros is we signed we signed dana brown or we don't sign anybody i just i don't i don't think they go any other direction i think they need the the guy to rebuild a farm system and i think that is dana brown uh, all the other guys i'm sure are fine and uh, i trust jim crane is gonna get the the right guy for the job he did get the right and guy and James click their personalities may not have clicked like they wanted, but, uh, he did get the job done. He got the Astros to the world series. So, but then they had to part ways. So I think, uh, crane's going to get the job done and thank you for making locked on Astros podcast. Your first listen every day, whether it's on YouTube, make sure you're going to keep on subscribing to us, go and make us your first listen and go ahead and check out the locked on MLB prospect pods podcast as well. Lindsey Crosby does a great job talking about not just the Astros, but prospects across baseball. He's a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts, and go and make them your second listen after you make the Locked On Astros podcast your first, first listen. For Brett, my name's Eric, and we are the Locked On Astros podcast, and until next time, go Stros.